Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to Politics Done Right from the studios of KPFT 90.1 FM Houston, your community radio station. We have a great program for you today. Well, today we have Maggie Hassan, Bill Crystal, David Rothkopf, and Daniel Coyne. They're going to talk about democracy and progressive issues. But you know, we're going to start out with something special. And I'll tell you about that a little bit further. But anyway, analyst. Uh, went on MSNBC. Uh, his name is David Ratkoff. He said he admonished the media and then rolled off democratic accomplishments better than any democratic politician has thus far. And he did it in 30 seconds or likely under 30 seconds. Something that should be going off the tip of everybody's tongue instead of allowing Republicans to cauterize in the minds of people that one, our economy is bad. It isn't. That inflation is astronomic. The fact, it isn't. And so there are all these factors that we are allowing Republicans to cauterize in the minds of people that because of an, a lack of an effective pushback could actually bring to fruition this blowout that people are contemplating will occur in November. It doesn't have to happen. We could actually have a blowout in the opposite direction. Then, of course, we have um, uh, the, the, same, the same analyst talks about the center, that the political center is not really America's center. If we look at Build Back Better, if we look at all the things that it supports, the reality is it's where most Americans are. Yet, if you look at what the media is doing, it's saying that Joe Biden has allowed the, the left to pull him to the left and away from the center. No. The progressives pulled Biden where the people are. It is the elitist Congress that isn't where the people are. Ask about every single policy in Build Back Better. And what will you find? You will find that it has north of 60% of all Americans. What that tells you? That tells you that in absolutely no way is mansion, cinema, and republics who are blocking America's success, it's nowhere clear or not. It's impossible to consider that they are the center. That's why on many articles that I write at the Daily Coast and at Op-Ed News, I talk a whole lot about this thing called the mythical center, the middle ground. Everybody wants to go to the middle ground. All the media talks about is the center. What they really mean is the center of where politicians are, which it's all of them or most of them sans the progressives or very much right of center. They are closer to where the plutocracy is. Those who would have America be that master indentured servant relationship. And we cannot have that. Again, Mr. Rotkoff made that quite obvious. We also have Maggie Hassan. Maggie Hassan really let Republicans have it for good reason. She made it clear. She was for filibuster just so that the majority won't overrun the minority. But when the minority begins to overrun the majority, when the minority become obstructionist, she realizes that in no way can the filibuster be considered something to protect the minority, but something that terrorists use to get their way. So that is where we're at with the filibuster. They're coming to pass to realize that the filibuster is unworkable. It's unworkable because it has always been undemocratic. 
The filibuster has always been democratic. And then, of course, the star at the end of the show is Daniel Cohen, the president of Indivisible Houston. He's going to talk about the progressive movement, but not only the progressive movement. He's going to talk about how and the type of candidates that progressives and others should be supporting. You can get Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right. On YouTube Live at politics done right dot com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My handle is at Egberto Willis at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. Before you get started, please remember to keep your community radio station in your minds, KPFT in your minds. Talk about it. Tell your friends about it. Tell them you know about this station in town, 90.1 FM Houston, that needs your support, that is there to provide what that nour- nourishment that we need. 713-526-5738. KPFT.org. Visit us online. Contribute online. KPFT. 90.1 FM. You can visit us at kpft.org. Starting the program today will be Thomas Cernak, a PDR Posse member, Politics and Right Posse member. He's going to talk about his new poem, Vanilla Island. I think you're going to want to hear about this poem. It's great. But you know how we get started. Let's get busy. This is a poem called Vanilla Island. And I'll read it to you, and then I want to see what you think, what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Here on Vanilla Island, breezes blow soft and light. Palm trees sway, and everywhere we go, there's a golden sun by day and an ivory moon at night. Here on Vanilla Island, we natives, too, are gold and pale. Our favorite time is noon. No shadows on the ground, no dark cloud nearer to make us fear an unfamiliar sight or sound. Here on Vanilla Island, we savor one flavor. No chocolate, banana, strawberry, or in between is ever tasted, ever seen, except what comes from the vanilla bean. Here on Vanilla Island, we are most blessed of all the islands east or west. With riches, we are sated and gated. Thank God daily, sip vanilla milk and play the ukulele. Here on Vanilla Island, we're all the same. We're not to blame for those on other islands who differ, suffer, die. A fig leaf hides our shame. Here on Vanilla Island, we set our arms on fire and with our fiery arms display a fearsome dance that keeps all ember souls away. Here on Vanilla Island, beaches are pure and white and everywhere we roam, the truth shines clear and bright. For we vanillans, safe and free, feel right at home in lonely huts on our oasis in the sea. You wrote that? Yes. And I I mean, it's actually very obvious, very clear. And I I know exactly what you're talking about. And that is prescient, brother. That is pre, I, it is completely understood. Okay, because I was wondering, some people were were questioning some of the uh, lines one of the questions I had, which I um, and uh, was about the fiery arms, and I don't know if you got that, but uh, uh, the, the fiery what? arms. I think, and tell me if I'm wrong in in my interpretation. When I heard the fiery arms, I looked at it as being oh. in command at all cost. Okay, Meaning? that's that's one. I was thinking of firearms. Firearms. Okay. Okay. Fiery arms. Fire. I'm thinking of people I, I, with, I, I, with, I, gun, I, with guns. With guns. Hey, hey, Tom, you yeah. could actually write a postscript to this poem by saying, here on Vanilla Island, we don't care what comes until the waves rise due to okay. the changing yeah. sun. You, you, you're not, hey, why don't you write that? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, you sound like you because, could be a poet, too. Hey, <laughs> that is, you know something? Um, with, without, with, you know, that, that sort of stuff, uh, where did you post it? I haven't I haven't posted it anywhere yet. Okay, when when you uh, feel comfortable with it, will you uh, will you give me um stuff that I can post it as a blog post in your name? 
Yeah, I can send it to you. Well, what I'm thinking, because... what, what I what I did, I did submit it to um, you. Know, you know the Progressive magazine. If you yes. ever read, I get the Progressive every couple months, and they have a they have a section for poetry. So I I did send them a copy of it and and said, you know, if you want to publish this, you know, I'd, I'd be interested. So I don't know whether or not they're going to do it or not, but uh, I. Well, you know what? Like, you're going to get it published. I'm going to publish it here, and and you know you should. I, uh, with with this kind of a poetry, you should act from your own medium account to put this stuff on too, man. You yeah, know. I do have I have a WordPress uh, site that I do have some stuff on, but I I haven't put too much poetry out there yet. So but I, I, like I love writing this it. one. Let me just tell you this: I love this. I think it's to the point that my daughter writes a lot, and I could see the smile on her face. So it says <laughs> quite a bit. Good okay. Job. All right. Okay, I just thought, you know, I'm glad uh, you got it because some people were saying, well, what, what are you talking about? And then, then it, I, I had to explain it a little bit. And they said, because this is really kind of, and it's sad, it's a sad poem in a way, because I, this is where I live. I mean, we we very really see people of color and we seem so insulated and isolated here that I kept thinking, you know, we're like in an island. And then I thought, well, like vanilla, you know, because we're all the same shade and it's, you know, the same. But Tom, thoughts. let me just say one thing. Let me just say something and not critical on you, but critical on people in general. Um, your poem, I am no, I am no scholar of literature or anything like that. In fact, it's a dead opposite, right? And it, it, it stares at you immediately. Uh, you know, the thing that known as willful ignorance, right? Right. Um, that anyone that does not understand a poem like this, that's what we're looking at. And, uh, and and what this does is it jars people. It may not jar them immediately, but it, 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 it effectively jars you in the background. You know, like when you have that aftertaste in your mouth, you right. know, this, even if you don't want to accept it right away, it gives you an aftertaste. We got the perfect interpretation of the media in this little piece here. Let's listen to it and then we'll take it on the other side. David Rothkopf, a foreign affairs analyst and an opinion columnist for USA Today and the Daily Beast. He is the host of the Deep State Radio podcast. Uh, David, there, there's another problem with uh, Washington news media coverage, which is if they were baseball reporters, the way they would cover the game is the winner is whoever won the last inning. So everything Joe Biden did in the first, second, third, fourth innings uh, of, of year one is forgotten when Build Back Better runs into the roadblock in the Senate and then voting rights runs into the filibuster, filibuster roadblock in the Senate. And there's no reporting about how Joe Biden in a year uh, pulled every single Democratic senator along into the space of being willing to change the Senate rule, uh, all except those last two. Uh, because in Washington coverage, it's all about what happened today. That determines who the winner and the loser is. Yeah, I agree, except uh, to use your metaphor, I don't think it's the last inning. I think it's the last pitch. You know, Joe Biden <laughs> yeah. is really only two innings into his first term as president. And everybody's saying, oh, well, he's in trouble. Two innings into the game, having passed over three trillion dollars in new legislation, appointed more judges than uh, anybody ever in history, created more jobs in his first year than anybody ever in history, undone, uh, undid a lot of the damage Trump did, restored American standing, ended the longest war in American history. And and that's what he did in year one. Uh, that's sort of in the middle of the second inning. So far, so good, I would say form that everybody can un have you ever wondered why is it that democrats don't have that just rolling off of their tongues that was so easy and it took less than 30 seconds the media isn't going to do it for you as they've said the media only looks at not the what's occurring in the last inning but what's occurring in the last pitch because that is how shallow the media has become that is how shallow the media has been paid to become. So therefore, in 30 seconds, whenever you're in front of a camera, is it so hard to do what Red Cop just did? I don't think so. Think about it. Let's go with what Bill Crystal is. Bill Crystal was on MSNBC giving some suggestions to 
Democrats. And I think these are suggestions that Democrats would do well to heed. Because as I tell you, and I've told many, Democrats have a messaging problem, not a policy problem, but we do continue to have a messaging problem. And uh, the fact about it is, I think what Bill Crystal had to say here makes a lot of sense. I want you guys to check it out and then we will take it on the other side. Listen to Bill Crystal here. If the Democrats just say, you know, we did a good job, we, 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 people don't quite see how good a job we did, and those Republicans, they don't really stand for anything, <laughs> they will not do well. They will not do the normal thing that happens in an off-year election is voters, they have grievances, they are disappointed in some ways, it's not quite as great as they thought it would be in, in, in November or two years ago, and so they vote somewhat against the incumbent party, against the party that has the White House. The Democrats have to create a choice. They can't let it just be a referendum on the Biden administration, and they've got to make the choice stark, and the choice can't just be the Republicans don't have a platform, it has to be that the Republicans are crazy, that the Republicans are pro-insurrection, that the Republicans are anti vaccine Vaccination. And they've got to find examples of that, Trump being the main one. Uh, but, but you know, Ali, it's not so easy for the Republicans to say, well, we don't care about all that stuff Trump's saying. They don't have the nerve to say that. In Minnesota, a moderate state, it's just somewhat swingish state, Al State, there was a Republican governor's debate, wasn't there, what was it, a week ago or something like that? And they each competed to be more loyal to Trump than the, than the last. That yep. has to be wrapped around their necks. That has to be made to stick in the voters' minds. This, you have a choice of two parties. One of them disappoints you a little bit, they're sort of, that makes some mistakes. And the other one is anti-democracy, totally irresponsible, at the whim of Donald Trump, has people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, et cetera, et cetera. They've got to make that a contrast and make it a choice. And that is sound advice. Bill Crystal, the one, the, the, one of the sons of the conservative movement in the United States, for him to become or says, we he's not only saying don't vote for Republicans, he's actually saying vote for Democrats to save our democracy. A message like that coming from the from someone like Bill Crystal, and you guys know that I've interviewed Bill Crystal a couple of times here on Politics Done Right, and Bill Crystal is really making the rounds. He's going around saying, hey guys, and look, there are a lot of my progressive friends like, why did you have Bill Crystal on your phone? You know who Bill Crystal is, the conservative guy. Yeah, very, very conservative. And when you have a guy like that come out and say, you cannot vote for Republicans because it is, it is actually anathema to everything that America represents. You know, you know that is, that is the issue. Listen now to Maggie Hassan, because what Maggie said is very important, and you'll see what I'm talking about as you see it. I know uh, I was not scheduled to speak, but I do want to respond as one of the signatories of the letter. I associate myself with everything that the other signatories have talked about in terms of wanting to restore the Senate's tradition of extended debate on issues of grave importance to the American people. But let me be clear about the reason that I now support an adjustment to the long-standing rules of the Senate. And it is because I never imagined when I signed that letter that not a single member of the Republican Party would stand up for our democracy since January 6th when we saw an acceleration of state laws that would allow partisans to overturn the impartial count of an election. But if we do not have a functioning democracy where people know that when they vote, that vote will be impartially counted and upheld, and the people who are defeated will accept defeat so that they can have an accountable elected representation in Washington, then there is no democracy. And when I signed that letter, I never imagined that today's Republican Party would fail to stand up for democracy. When I signed that paper, she signed a paper saying 
that she supported keeping a filibuster. All right. Now, I don't know if you know Hassan, but she is a pretty moderate Democrat. In fact, there are times that I wish, come on, lady, let's support more progressive policies. But when you are in a position that you've lost Hassan, when you are in a position that you have lost so many of these other mainstream Democrats, you know where it is. You hear me talk about the mythical center a whole lot. You know, we everybody talk about these politicians are Biden is moving the entire Democratic Party or the, the left has a lot of force Biden to move the Democratic Party to the left. First of all, as if that is an issue or, or that's a problem, right? It really isn't. But I want you to take a look at this and then we'll take a take it on the other side. Coming a state in 1912, Arizona has never had two Democratic senators until now. One of those senators is a centrist who keeps independent voters and moderate Republican voters in mind in choosing to support broadly popular positions that are supported by large majorities of voters. The other is Kirsten Sinema. The Washington news media incorrectly depicts Senator Sinema as the centrist and in effect regards Arizona Senator Mark Kelly and 47 other Democratic senators as out of touch progressives who, along with House Democrats, are to blame for pushing Joe Biden too far to the left. The center used to be defined as the place where most voters are. But as our next guest points out in the headline of his new piece for the Daily Beast, D.C. is a donut. There is no center in Washington politics. Joining us now is David Rothkopf, a foreign affairs analyst and an opinion columnist for USA Today and the Daily Beast. He is the host of the Deep State Radio podcast. Uh, David, this notion that centrism is whatever Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema and I don't know, maybe one or two Republican senators say it is. Well, it's a kind of crazy notion. You know, there's this idea right now, blame, blame the left for Biden's struggles, except in the first case, Biden's not really struggling. He had a very successful first year. His poll ratings are higher than Trump's were. And he won the last election by eight million votes. Um, but in the second case, on every single thing he went for, he had the support of those 48 Democrats you're talking about. And on most of it, he also had the support of Cinema and Manchin. Now, if you say blame the left, you're saying those 48 are the left and it's just these two people who represent the center. Of course, it's ludicrous. In Washington, there really is no center. There's a Republican bloc that seeks only to obstruct uh, this administration. And their Democrats were usually together except for these couple of people. Now, out in the country, it's a different story. And that's, you know, one of the problems we've got. The politics of Washington has become disconnected from the politics of the United States. Joe Biden is a centrist. And if you go through the initiatives he has supported, whether it's child care, education reform, environmental initiatives and so forth, they are all supported by very substantial majorities of Americans, Democrats and independents, the center and the left. So the critique is completely unsubstantiated and out of touch. Rothkaff was much too kind. Uh, he really meant uh, they're obstructionist Republicans and they are Democrats who allow these obstructionists to succeed for a reason. And I always come out and I said, you know, whenever we talk about uh, too many, uh, too many Democrats are in the, in, is, are, you know, for functionally no different than Republicans. We know, we know that's not a fact per se. But when we say functionally no different than Republicans is that the outcomes becomes the same. The people who need, the people who should be served are not. And those that are undeserving get served. We have to break that cycle. Excellent piece. Uh, uh, there is no center. Remember, whenever you hear somebody talks about going to the center, what they really means mean is doing what is right for corporations, not what's right for the average American citizen. Today we have our special guest, President of Indivisible Houston. But you know, that's only a small part of Daniel. Daniel uh, is actually much deeper than just 
the president of uh, Indivisible Houston. Cohen is all around Houston making changes and making sure things happen from the grassroots. Daniel Cohen, welcome to Politics and Right. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's good to see you, brother. I, I, uh, we, we haven't caught up in a while, man. I miss your face. I miss, I, I miss talking. I, I miss you too. But you know what, man? You're, you're holding down the fort there in Houston like a champ as usual, making things happen. Hey, I heard through the grapevine that you have quite a story to tell me. I understand that uh, there is a race in Texas. It's not even a federal race, but it's likely the most important race to talk about. And it may have quite a bit of repercussions. Talk to me. Okay, so down here in Houston, the fourth largest city in the country, uh, we have a politician who's been around for 48 years. His name is Senator John Whitmire. His state senator is one of three Democratic senators in the Houston area. He's a dean of the Senate, so he's been around a really long time. He's got that uh, status and recognition in terms of what's going on in the Texas legislature. Um, but Whitmire is on the wrong side of a lot of issues. Uh, there's prison issues that he's, he was famously uh, quoted on John Oliver on being the wrong side of prison issues and not wanting to put air conditioning into prisons. Um, he's also been on the wrong side of environmental issues uh, and has a number of other problems as a static politician. He came into politics as a George Wallace delegate. So we're talking about- Wait, wait about a minute, people. wait a minute. George Wallace delegate as in George Wallace of Ye Yonder? Oh yeah, yeah, George Wallace delegate. Yeah, so he's, he's. I mean, he came in with somebody who's a card carrying, you know, a, a, a conscious racist, if you will. Um, right. And in fact, the, the, the most famous one in democratic politics in decades, probably. And he, so that's, that's the story on him. He's got $9 million, but he also um, has a history of not showing up for things and for leaving uh, Democrats holding the bag. So in 2003, there was a redistricting fight. A lot of people went to New Mexico to shut down the session. Whitmire was the one when the Senate came back into session, he was the one that broke ranks and made it so that there would be a quorum to make that horrible redistricting go through when they carved up the state the first time. Uh, he also attended the Astros game when he was invited to discuss, as any senator wanted to weigh in, invited to discuss the horrible anti-voting legislation that passed Texas in this past year. So he didn't bother to show up for that fight either. There's a number of other fights that he's absentee on. But what's where he's really leaving us holding the bag is that he's going to run for mayor in 2023. How he's do you been know open that? about this. He, yeah, he's he's been open about this. This is not a rumor. He's declared that he's running for mayor for 2023, which means that our governor, the infamous Greg Abbott, governor of Texas, can decide to not fill that seat after he vacates it, or he can, you know, there there may be other maneuvers that he can do. Um, but he's famous for not calling special elections if not call if delaying those elections benefits him politically, and it will because if you get rid of John Whitmire, that's one less Democratic vote. Even if they play ball on a lot of issues, he'd still rather leave the seat empty than put somebody else in or call an election and give us a chance to elect another progressive. So um, one person who's a great community organizer and was very, very upset at the idea of him leaving us holding a bag named Molly Cook jumped into the race. And John Whitmire does, didn't know who Molly Cook was two months ago, but he knows who she is now. And she's an ER nurse who is currently she's she's minimized her, her role very much to run for this for right now. But she's been a, a long time ER nurse. And she also has been a lead organizer on the movement to stop the I-45 freeway development, which, which, would destroy which so them. far they've been slowing it down pretty well. They have been. Yeah, the Department of Transportation, actually, they got them involved. And that helped a lot because. The state of Texas, the Texas Department of Transportation, also known as TxDOT, right. for those of you out there in other, other states, um, you know, has has been hard charging for this. And if you look at this, the city, like the, the history of Houston, I mean, it's hard to stop crude oil from flowing. It's hard to stop concrete from flowing. And it's hard to stop uh, law enforcement from acting like cowboys and, you know, shooting at people. Those are like three really hard fights in this city. So to make any progress on stopping a road is a, a pretty impressive feat. Exactly. She didn't do it alone. She knows that she did it with other people, but she was a person who got other people involved and her campaign's operating the same way. So they're knocking down doors, stuff like that, and, and talking to all kinds of voters. This is a new district. We just had another redistricting. I'm in Senate District 15 now. I wasn't in it before. You're kidding but, me. So uh, what did it do to your um, to, to the chairperson of the precinct? 
Well, well, I mean, I'm fine. Oh, in terms of who's the Senate district chair, like me, I mean, I'm fine. I'm, I still live in the precinct. So precinct. I live in the same precinct I did before. Right. But, uh, I, you know, but, but in terms of him, he doesn't know the people over here. He doesn't, he doesn't know people in my neighborhood. He has no idea what's going on when it comes to this. And he's only now coming to the realization that $9 million may not be able to save him because at this point she's picking up club endorsements and there's infighting across all of the different democratic traditional constituencies between people who are in Whitmire's camp and people who are in Molly's camp. If he loses, then it likely upends the mayoral race for Houston for 2023. And in Houston, we have the strongest mayor system of any city in yes. the United States. And, and it's huge amounts of money, huge budget, huge control down here, second largest port in the country, which means that this state level Senate district Democratic primary is the most important race that's going on in the country right now. Hands down, hands down that anywhere else, if you're if you are if you are a progressive who's looking at upsets, looking at opportunities, looking at at the field, then I'm telling you, there's something wild going on down here in Texas. He's going to be very hard to beat. And she's not running like she's ever going to be ahead. She's running like like she's behind and she should. And so is everybody else down here. And there's a lot of dynamics, but it's pretty interesting stuff that's going on in, in Houston. Well, you know, earlier we were talking about some other candidates that are running as uh, running in, in, in the area and in the state proper. I mean, uh, we have someone like Jasmine Crockett running up north uh, who got endorsed by Bernice uh, Johnson. And I am watching some good young candidates, one that should have been you as well. Young, good young candidates out there really starting to buck the system from a progressive viewpoint, but understanding how to use their progressivicity. You know, I, I spoke to Jasmine Crockett and she understands how it needs oh, to yeah. be done. And uh, now I spoke to a couple others that I won't mention right now who seem to understand that you're in Texas. Uh, some people are not necessarily aware and some people may succumb to some of the 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 caricature that folks make of people who are trying to do goodwill. And they they are cognizant of that and know exactly how they're going to campaign. How are you finding that with uh, Miss Cook and others that you are surrounded by? Uh, she's she's great. I mean, she comes across great. She has an answer in terms of everything that should be going on. Um, you can feel the energy. She's a fun person, I think. And I that's I know that in politics, you know, we have sort of a sour face a lot of times when we're looking at I mean, these are important issues. Right. But she's a happy warrior. Um, and so I, I think I think there's something very beneficial about that. I'll also mention, of course, that while this is in Texas, we are talking about Senate District 15 in Houston, redrawn to include more urban areas. So it's it's not necessarily what you think of when you get out. Maybe somebody would think of when they get out, you know, even to Kingwood, right? They're like your right. stomping grounds or even farther out than that, where it has a little bit, you know, less of the the this Houston specific stamp on it. Right. But having said that, uh, I think that she is plain spoken. Her campaign is based on the idea that we should be looking after public health in all of its aspects before you end up in her emergency room. That there are so many different things that impact us um, that that we can solve. And man, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know I'm. I know I'm. Talking no, no, no. To no. You're not speaking to all. me. You're speaking but, to an audience. Hey, that, and so yeah, if y'all watch Egberto, what he says about Medicare for all and the importance of it, fully aligned with the values of this. I mean, it's just that, that it's so important um, to make sure that we have real representation that understands that. I mean, the opposite of it, of course, is what we're getting from Whitmire is literally an empty chair. But if she would be better than just someone who's filling the chair, if she would be somebody who actually focuses on, th on things like cleaning up the air, on preventing highways and developments that benefit developers and oil and gas men, because of course we drive our cars on the road and pay for more gasoline, um, as opposed to, uh, and, and in the meantime, not caring, them not caring about the cost, such as, you know, 500 houses getting eliminated, right? Or businesses having to close because you put a highway through the middle or highways dividing neighborhoods if they, as they historically have in Houston, where you have vibrant black communities put, you know, a highway through the middle of Fourth Ward, several decades go by, rename the place. She's conscious of those issues. And people like Whitmire for years have been holding the bag for the people who created those issues, the people who dirty the air, dirty the water, dirty the roadways, hurt our infrastructure, divide communities. I mean, that so that it's like polar opposites, right? Um, I think 
What's really impressive as well, like beyond that, is that she really does know the issues from top to bottom. She was asked recently what her opinion was on the strong mayor system in the city of Houston. That's not a state Senate level issue, um, but she understands the overlap between the two. And what she said was not only should we change the system so that less people, uh, it takes less council members to get something um, on the agenda, which is something that several groups down here have pushed for as well, and actually making it a little bit more like other cities, but that we should actually have a lot more people. We should expand city council because Houston's a big city. It's huge. There's not enough very diverse. Yeah. A lot of different areas too. Geographic right. and ethnic. Yeah. Yeah. And we have 10% turnout mayor and city elections. And so I, I think that she gets the issue. She's incredibly intelligent. Um, she's really inspiring and a happy warrior. Um, she has a good philosophy and a view on governance, which is, you know, make sure that we take care of health. We're supposed to be proactive, not reactive. Reactive means that people get hurt in terms of protecting our public health. So I, I think she has something that it's based on, something that's focused on, and that when you look at all the different sub-issues within that, it's a, it's a clear delineation between her and the incumbent. So she, she's doing a great job. That's how she's talking. Now, let me tell you something. And first of all, before before I ask this one, do you think this race is one that needs to be nationalized? I think you should all I think like, she, look, I'm going to speak to speak to everyone here. Look, she needs the money. y'all. John Whitmire's got nine million dollars. He's got the backing of oil and gas. He's got the backing of developers. He's got the backing of finance. Um, he's got the backing of law firms. And she has the backing of the people. It's a straight up and down pick them fight, the most important primary in the country. So you definitely should check out Molly Cook's website. I believe it's Molly Cook for Senate. I'll confirm it for you, but you should give her the money. Honestly, if you got 15, 25 bucks, you want to make an excellent impact by backing a left movement against somebody who's an entrenched, bad Democrat. Like this is the time to do it. So yeah, de definitely back her. Now, um, the interesting thing about it, and I, I want to uh, go uh, switch a little bit here. Uh, we've been we, we had hopes uh, last section last cycle that we could have taken out, uh, and we almost did taken out Cruz with uh, Beto. Beto is now running for governor, and I am of the I am of the opinion I, I am not looking at the polls specifically right now because. I think Poland has become a real bad science over the last, uh, not science, but whatever the hell it is. It has been, uh, it has been, you know, pretty, uh, pretty inconclusive in it, it, over the last several, last couple of cycles. I, I know there are times that I would say, oh, the it came within the margin of error of the polls. But when the polls constantly pick, even though within the margin, it constantly picks the wrong one, you have to be a bit concerned about, you know, what's going on but anyhow i am of the opinion that texas is ripe for a takeover earlier than most believe if 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 democrats progressives go out there and do the work what's your thoughts on that oh i mean we gotta talk about what we mean in terms of ripe for takeover right so i'll give you the ups and the downs on it um it is the revolution if you if you actually change the state government. Um, we still have conservative Democrats here. So we got, you know, like, like a lot of places, there's several fights going let, on. Let me hold you right there but, because I need to stop you right yeah. there real quick, real quick, because you just did, you just hit the magic that I was talking about. I say we, I say uh, we win the prime, we, we win the election in the primaries. In other words, you just said with a, with a sort of a snark, we have yeah. conservative Democrats. So which means sure. the work that you are doing right now, as far as saying, hey, let's start rewriting the map now with uh, the appropriate candidates, not the old guard, but there's a woman that wants to get in the new guard. OK, I just wanted to insert that to oh, sure. some flavor. Yeah, def no, definitely. I mean, we, yes, we have to win the primaries. Um, I would say, you know, look, it's a heck of a fight and different parts of it are actually going to be won at different points. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we're going to win because I think that you can't hold this up forever. I mean, when you got a grid failing, the infrastructure damage is just, I mean, it's, it's instability is out of control. And then you got mass widespread uh, housing issues, health issues, like all this stuff going on. Eventually, you're going to reach a point where people are going to figure out how to do it so that they can make sure their friends and family can live better lives. Uh, and, you know, if you, if you put people's survival on the line like that, eventually things will change um, one way or another. 
So I, I think that I just want to be clear there. I think that we're going to win the fight in Texas. Um, I don't like putting timelines on it for the same reason I, that you don't trust the polling industry. Right. Uh, you know, because a lot of people, you know, talk to cameras on pol- political shows and say, I think uh, this, this and this is going to happen. And <laughs> if we check their batting average, right, it's like hey, this bat like 20 percent. You're like, why, why do I watch this guy? You know, because, um, you know, somebody's friends is some producer over at MSNBC or whatever it is. But, you know, you right now we're talking we're real. Right. So I'll be real in that. You know, I don't I don't like to like put years on things or when things are going to happen because I try to be careful and I really don't know. So I don't want to say a number because then I'm like misleading people or acting more confident than I am. But I do think that things will change at different time periods. So the real, it's like the centerpiece in a lot of ways of it all is at the state level in terms of if you ripple across the whole state. Right. Because a lieutenant governor can do whatever they want. The AG makes all our legal decisions across the state. And that's why you have this dual contradictory situation where they yell free enterprise. But then it's really just that corporations get all the money. Right. So, you know, socialism for the rich, right? or, or, or excuse me, profits for the rich. And then, you know, the rest of us get to pay the bill. Right. And they make off with the money. Um, so that I mean, Texas is like the greatest example of that. There's a book about Houston in particular called Free Enterprise City, which is uh, just about that. But as it relates to Houston, that they tout the free enterprise success of Houston. But when you look closer, it's neither successful at taking care of people, nor is it actually free exactly. enterprise. <laughs> because actually the oil and gas folks get whatever they want. Um, but. Nevertheless, so I think that you're going to see, I think that the statewide stuff, like the state level stuff, where they draw the lines for the congressional maps and for all the other state maps and things like that, that's where I see the most institutional power that ripples if you're talking about Texas as a whole. If you're looking at Houston, um, the most progress we've actually made is the county because Lita Hidalgo is a drastic, drastic change from Ed Emmett. Even even if she's, you know, it's, it's like, is she... All county judges have to, you know, to be be someone, you know, across the party to some degree, right. things like that. But so I, I would never say I don't like in um, Lena Hidalgo to say AOC, like in terms of exactly where they are ideologically. But the change is hugely different. And her priorities are very aligned with what, you know, universal pre-K education, health care, criminal justice reform, stuff like that. She's moving the needles on the right stuff. So that appeals to a lot of people. And then we've got a Democratic majority on commissioner's court, and it looks like there's going to be a fourth person, a fourth Democrat. Now, that that could actually paradoxically weaken some of the left movement on council because it dilutes the power of other people. So if that person is for the to you know, for example, to the right of, say, Commissioner Rodney Ellis, at least on paper, who we all know to be mm-hmm. generally left, if you just look at where he is on issues. Right. And that actually moves the court a little bit, even though it locks in a Democratic majority. So we'll have to probably pressure them. But the but when you compare that to city council, where you have a majority Democrats, you know, a Democratic council, we got this mayor who's, you know, in the pocket of the police unions and he appoints a Republican as a mayor pro t- and who, all, mayor who also <laughs> sit in as a minority in minority uh, in the minority party in the house was able to have a chairman position yeah he has a lot of stuff i don't know you look that up i mean he voted down a lot of like uh just basic transparency bills you know just stuff like that where it makes sense that somebody would go to city hall after that because you know (laughs) that's where you go and you don't want everyone to see what you're doing with the money right like it it gets scrutinized and he acts very offended whenever anybody scrutinizes what he does with the money and says what you know it's you, you know you know if we have we have a vindictive mayor down here but i mean City Hall is hard. You got to topple the mayor's house probably to take City Hall. And there's a lot of candidates and it's a low turnout election and things like that. So there's challenges there. So I feel like the counties where we made the most progress, the city of Houston and the city level stuff, but particularly Houston, that would be a big deal. Right. That's very that's that's kind of uphill fight. Austin also right now is an uphill fight. Some of the federal maps are starting to see some progress, too. So I'd say like county and then the federal and then you'll start seeing some of the other stuff here and there that starts to fall. Well, I I tell you what I want to see going forward, and I'm I'm hoping that some of our young folks like yourself and others in the movement will start doing that. Um, When my my peeps were the Occupy peeps. okay, and we failed for some specific reasons. Right. And uh, I know I, I know a lot of the. A lot of the millennials think they were occupied, but hey, we we old folks were really behind the uh, occupy. 
And a, if I had a dollar every time somebody told me they were the real force behind <laughs> Occupy, my man. You know, you know my buddy saying? wrote a book. My buddy wrote the book. <laughs> I interviewed him. He just wrote the book, the 10 year anniversary of Occupy. He wrote okay. the book. And I looked at him and I said, hey, how old are you, man? He's like, oh, I think he's like 46 years old, right? And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm interviewing the guy who wrote the cast. I met him in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, right? And I remember, I remember the genesis of all this stuff. I met him at the Democracy Convention in Madison. And I'm like, hey, guy, don't you know how many of us were really kind of the backbone of this stuff? And here you come and you write a damn book about it. <laughs> no, he, he's a great guy. I, I sat with lunch with him in Madison. And I mean, but he wrote the 10 year, look out for the 10 year anniversary of Occupy. He wrote it. Okay. And, and, and actually, he named me about 10, 15 times in the book, you know. Hey, yeah. that's a good man. See, so, he got the story right. He's great. He's yeah. great. But the thing about it, Daniel, is I'm waiting. You know, I'm, you know how, you built, um, how you built Indivisible Houston? And Indivisible did quite a bit. I think it's time to go the next step to, uh, to, to move in. You, you, you have the plan, the city, where the city power lies, et cetera. I think it's time for, for the, the young folks to start infiltrating those spaces because those people need to feel it on their backs, like the fear they felt when Occupy they thought was going to change capitalism. Occupy came this yeah. close till, well, you know what happened. Hey man, yeah, another whole other discussion. I'll that I'll probably be in the audience when that panel comes up. I'll let you and Michael White and everybody else like <laughs> kind of hash it out. But no, I mean, I, hey, I I think it's definitely time for change. Um, it's definitely right, and and I do think that folks. I think that you do have to use all these different levers. Mm -hmm. um, street actions, I don't think are. I think street actions have still have value, but they've changed context a lot. That even from 2018 to, or 2016 to now, right. they've changed context and when it's effective, how it's effective, is it effective? Should we be using this tool for this? How do we want, why are we really here? Things like that. Those are big and important questions. And they were being asked well before 2016 too. I know there, right. this has been discussed all the way back to, you know, uh, uh, MLK days podcast. before that. Yeah. Yeah, like even, I mean, right? So like, there's a lot of that question, you know, are we recreating MLK kind of imagery and, and try, you know, MLK kind of imagery when there's other things that are going on now that, you know, that, like, what, what do we need to do in terms of our playbook? Um, you know, so, so I think that like that stuff's valuable, but we do also have to have candidates winning elections. We and I think that's to, where I'm going. Actually, I don't think yeah. I'm going for the, because look, first of all, the, the, the street movement, let's say with the, um, <clears throat> The uh, what's his name? The guy who got choked to death. Um, George Floyd. George Floyd. The George Floyd. Uh, the George Floyd protests. I think are very responsible for a lot of changes, but I don't know that it works twice that close together because people eventually get concerned about certain issues. And go ahead. You. you I, I saw. Well, no. I mean. I mean. You know. Tr Turner down here shut down a lot of the progress. I mean, that was very measured. Nothing, not much happened when it came to that. And we bury a lot of history here too. I mean, in, in general, that, that that's, and that's the challenge is that we've been looking at these mass march movements and we see limitations on them to some extent. Mm -hmm. I think that the political pressure of the last few years actually did a lot because it swung a lot of public opinion and it right. twisted a lot of arms. So like the early ones, for example, Packing airports across the United States led to change in approval ratings that led right. to change in policy to some degree. Um, the Women's March, I think, led to a lot of people being energized, which led to a lot of like seats changing hands and public opinion changing on things. Right. Uh, a lot of the marches on the during, March for uh, Life, the March for Life. That, uh, the, the, oh, well, the Florida students. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Or or. Um, you know, the marches against family separation, the, right. you know, the DH, march against the official DHS policy, we still have all kinds of horrible things going on. But at least, you know, that changed that particular policy. It got them to run at the time. Um, and so th there were there were changes like that. There were actions that took place. But it varies by type of government. You can go to City Hall with 100 people. It doesn't matter down here. And it varies by a lot of times, at least. And but, it varies by um, issue and it stopped working as well over time. And you, I agree. And, and that's why I mentioned yeah. I agree with you 100 percent. And earlier you mentioned you said something to the effect running. And, you know, I, I give you a, I give you hell a lot of times. 
But what I, I but I'm, I'm, I do mean it. I think guys like you and a lot of guys in your posse, it is time for you guys to take it to the next level. Um, I, I, I really do think it is time to get new leadership. I think it is time for younger folks to get in there and actually make the case. Though, first of all, most of those candidates uh, running right now, they're not uh, 10% as persuasive as you are with the material that can get to people. The thing about it is, when do you make the switch from activists to the person who goes ahead and campaign? And the thing about it is not campaigning in the old style that, that you have to meet X, Y, and Z. One of the reasons I enjoyed speaking to, um, to Fulford, Fulford was it seemed like she was ready to make that calculated change. I'm not saying giving up on your progressiveness or anything like that, but be progressive, but in a manner that talks to people. I, like I told her, I said, you can come into Kingwood and you can tell these kids, these parents who are scared about their kids, I have these three kids. I love my three kids. I want to make sure that these things are right with your kids. She can come yeah. in and also to the oil men and say, my husband works for the oil company. My husband, I know, it, look, I, I that's the part I talk about grow up now. <laughs> You're not, not oh, you, sure. but others. My husband works for the oil company. Uh, he's he the, the change has to come from within and without, you know? And that's it, well, it, it does, yeah. And you well, and it's it's a hard balance too. You want to get people in who are gonna be them who can win and also stay themselves, stick to their values, things like that. Right. And you're gonna need a sustained number for a really long time to make yes. any kind of dent in it. And then you, you, you got to win quite a few races, but um, I am, I do generally agree with you that we need people. We need a new generation of candidates. We are seeing them step up. We're seeing people step up right now. Corey Bush. The, yeah. Can't. Or Corey Bush. Whereas even down here, we're seeing a lot of young, younger candidates yeah. um, stepping up. You're going to have some seats with some, some of the younger Ben Chow, you know, another great candidate that people can support is, is a, uh, He's running in precinct four for commissioner's court. He's running against the right hand of a billionaire or former right, right hand of a billionaire uh, over at the Arnold Foundation. So he could use help. You know, that was it. He's he's the kind of guy who plans stuff on the ground, pressures the business chambers. He's pressured a JP before and kind of helped out with the tenants union, you know, one to one and, and some of those actions and pays his dues each month. And he's he uh, he's um, more than it, like one of his main accomplishments in all of it was he worked for. He worked in the elections office and uh, made sure that drive through voting, you know, was a thing. And, and right. there were all these wonderful stories about people using that that as a method of voting, both Democratic and Republican and independent for that matter. Um, so point being, there's a lot of young candidates who are stepping up. The other thing, though, is that. Um, I, and I know I know we need candidates, but it's also just younger people kind of taking the reins and being in positions of power, whatever they might be. The directors, right. these nonprofits, you know, the head, the head, cause there's, there are all kinds of issue groups, you know, organizations that are like progressive training, leadership discourse, whatever it is. And then when you look closely, there's a fight in there, just like there is in every other wing out there. Yeah. There's some centrists that want to make some, you know, want to make a few multiples on everybody else whenever they can. And then there's lefties who are like, no, like we, you know, you need, you, you know, need what to we want. People, yeah. yeah. If people unionize me and support them and like, we should be looking at our business and whether or not it's ethical and like you y'all are just picking up cash from anybody. So I think that like, there's, we got to win all these struggles and the new generation has to win struggles in these different places. But to your point about candidates, Molly Cook is absolutely one of the best candidates. Anybody well, we, look, we're point. coming up on time right now. And I want you to go ahead and tell me a little bit about where Molly Cook fits into this picture that you and I are talking about to make to effectively make that change from the old guard that's owned to a new guard who is not owned by the plutocracy, but by serving the people. All right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. Molly Cook is someone who, like I said before, cares about all aspects of public health because she wants to make sure to address those issues before you end up in her emergency room. She is a trained ER nurse. She's also an organizer against the for, uh, Highway Interstate 45, which is going to destroy people's homes, businesses, and all kinds of other, and cause all kinds of other problems, divide neighborhoods. And she's taking on John Whitmire, who's a do nothing, derelict in duty senator, one of the most powerful in the state of Texas, been there 48 years since George Wallace was a delegate. And it's a straight up and down kind of battle between someone who's going to represent people and somebody who is 
in your words, uh, your commonly used phrase here, represent the plutocracy. So if you want a young candidate, the next generation of candidates taking on somebody who's been in office for 48 years for all the wrong reasons, wants to leave us holding the bag while he goes off to run for mayor before he finishes his next term, you should support Molly Cook. Molly Cook for Texas Senate, Senate District 15. Reach, you know, reach in your pocket if you got it. Give her a Bernie. Give her 27 bucks. Like, <laughs> hook her up, right? Like, give her a Bernie. Please, I'm, she's running against a guy with $9 million who just wants to buy this seat and then buy the mayor's mansion and vacate his seat and leave us at the will of Greg Abbott. So please, support, Molly Cook fits into the picture because she's taking this guy on. You know, I mean, she, she wants to beat him. And she needs to be able to even that finance to take away his financial advantage. She doesn't need nine million. But if y'all can do out there what you've done for so many other candidates as audiences of left leaning listeners, trying to help people and good candidates win fights and win primaries and things like that. Now is the time to do it. So that, that's that's why that's where Molly Cook fits into the picture. Daniel Cohen, president of Indivisible Houston, all around activist and he's not just a texas activist he's not just a houston activist he's a national activist it's been my pleasure it's been my honor to have you as usual senor cohen thank you Berto. you're awesome man keep doing what you do you can get any one of my books as a gift for becoming a member of kpft go to kpft.org click that donate button select politics done right as the show you're supporting and go into the gift area and select as I see it, class warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom, or you can also get It's Worth It, how to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors, or go to How to Make America Utopia, take away the economy from those who rigged it. If you get one book, it gives you one particular membership price, two books, you get a discount, and three books, you get an even better discount. So please consider becoming a member of KPFT, and in the process, you get the gifts of the books. You can get Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right. On YouTube Live at politics done right.com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My handle is at Egberto Willis at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That's it, folks. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O 